I've got eight grandkids and a ninth on the way. You will never truly know how much you can love your grandkids until you have some of your own. I'm convinced that grandkids are a reward for not killing your kids. But there's one thing I know about kids. My kids, your kids, all kids. They want what they want when they want it. Not yet, wait a minute, or no, are not in their vocabulary. And I'm not sure we ever actually grow out of that. We're in week three of a series on the Lord's Prayer. In Luke 11, we're told that Jesus was in a certain place praying when his disciples came up to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, it's interesting that the only time Jesus' disciples said, Lord, teach us, is in this particular area. They, they asked, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, Jesus taught them a lot of things, but this is the one thing they asked Jesus to teach them. When they watched Jesus pray, when they listened to him pray, they knew there was something different about his prayers. His prayers were birthed out of relationship. His prayers were personal. His prayers were powerful. And so when they wanted to discover the secret of Jesus' life, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And so the Lord gave them the Lord's prayer, not a prayer to repeat, but a pattern to follow. Now, now let me remind you of what we've already learned. We learned first that prayer begins with a relationship. Jesus said, when you pray, pray this way, Father... Or our Father. For our prayers to be powerful and personal, we must have a relationship with God. We must know Him as our Heavenly Father. But Jesus makes it clear that not everyone has God as their Father. Now the New Testament tells us two ways that we enter into the family of God. The first way is through birth. Jesus said, or, or John says in John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, But to all who receive him, Jesus, who believe in his name, he gives the right to become children of God. When Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about how to enter the kingdom of God, he said, unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then he said, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. Don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. Jesus was saying when we place our faith in him, God's spirit, the Holy Spirit, comes to live in us and make us a new person. Now don't miss this. It's not your effort that makes you different. It's the Holy Spirit living in you. But there's another picture in the New Testament to describe how we enter this relationship with God, and it's adoption. The Bible says in Romans 8, verse 15, So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. God looked down from heaven and he said, I want you to be a part of my family. He made the choice to adopt us. Now, I love this picture. It's from Aria's Gotcha Day, the day she officially became a purpose. John and Christy chose her as their very own. And that's what God has done for each and every one of us. He looks down on us and says, I want you to be a part of my family. But notice what is the same in both of these pictures, being born or being adopted in God's family. It's that God speaks. Spirit is the one who makes us a part of God's family. So let me ask you, is the Spirit of God living in you? Do you know God as your Father? Do you have a personal relationship with Him? Because it is only then that you will be able to pray powerful prayers, the kind that move heaven and earth. But notice what Jesus said next. He said, holy is your name. When we enter into the presence of God, we don't barge in with our list of things that we want. The very first thing that happens as we pray is we are overwhelmed with the holiness of God. That's what happened to Isaiah when he entered into the throne room of God. He saw the seraphim and they were saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. 
That's what happened to John when he had that, that vision of heaven in the book of Revelation. It says that day after day and night after night, the seraphim were crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And yet, that is perhaps the one thing that we miss the most today. We have forgotten the holiness of God. And that has caused us to be a, a little too casual with God. It is true that God is our Father, but He is also the holy God. There is nothing sinful in Him. There is nothing sinful around Him. He is altogether good, the source and the standard of everything that is good. And when we enter into His holy presence, we cannot but be confronted with our own sinfulness. That's why Isaiah cried out, I am doomed. I am a sinful man. You see, recognizing God's holiness will drive us to our knees in repentance and in worship. That's why we praise Him, because He and He alone is worthy of our praise. But when we get to this next phrase in the Lord's Prayer, we get to the foundational truth of prayer. Does prayer focus on us? Or does prayer focus on God? Is prayer about getting God to do what I want? Or is prayer about discovering what God wants and then doing it? Many of us approach prayer kind of like Aladdin's lamp. And God is this genie in a bottle that we are freeing so that he can grant our wishes. But is that what prayer is? Is that who God is? Is God simply a genie in a bottle? I want you to listen to what Je Jesus said we are to pray. He said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, there are two parts to this petition. First of all, Jesus said, your kingdom come. That word kingdom is found 127 times in the Gospels. That's a lot. When the angel appeared to Mary and said she was going to give birth to a son, the angel said his kingdom will never end. When Jesus started his earthly ministry and preached his first sermon, he preached repent and believe the good news for the kingdom of God is near. And then it says from that time on, he preached the kingdom of God. He said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God. That is why I was sent. Jesus told us to seek first the kingdom of God, and then everything else will be added to us. We are told that we must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. Most of the stories that Jesus told were about the kingdom of God. Jesus said that the good news of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world, and then the end will come. When the Pharisees asked Jesus when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus said, the kingdom is already among you. But what is the kingdom? What does that mean? Well, let me share with you two things. First, there are only two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of God and there's the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of this world. And each and every one of us belong to one of those two kingdoms. Now, if we belong to the kingdom of God, that means that He, God, is the king of our kingdom. He is in control. He reigns supreme. His word is final. When we pray your kingdom come, we're inviting him to rule and reign in our lives. And here's what I know. The happiest subjects in any kingdom are those who have surrendered to, control, to the control of the king. Years ago, when, when we lived in Titusville, Florida, we had one of the pastors from Second Baptist Church, Aradia, Romania, come and speak at our church. At that time, it was the largest Baptist church in Europe. Later on, this pastor said something that, that caught my attention. He said there is a big difference between American Christianity and Romanian Christianity. And then he said, you Americans talk about commitment. In Romania... We talk about surrender. And then he said this. He said, when you make a commitment, you are in control. You decide what you're going to do, then you do it. But when you surrender to another person, you put the other person in control. They decide what you're going to do, 
and then you do it. And then he closed with this. He said, you Americas need to get away from commitment and move to surrender. Now, there are so many ways that this is illustrated practically, but one is in the area of giving and tithing. You see, some of us are committed to giving. We give regularly. We decide what we're going to give. We give it, and, and that's it. We're committed. But then some of you are not just committed to giving. You are surrendered to tithing. You let God decide what you're going to give, and then you give it gratefully and generously. You see, when we become a part of the kingdom of God, it changes everything about us. It changes the way we raise our kids. It changes the way we look at our money. It changes the way we treat other people. It even changes the way we vote in elections. It changes the way we look at success. It changes the things that we dream of. It changes everything. But it's based on surrender. Surrendering to the rule and reign of King Jesus. And every area of our life must be surrendered because any unsurrendered area is the area that will ultimately lead to our downfall. Do you remember the story from Greek mythology about Achilles? His mother was a goddess who wanted to make Achilles immortal. So she took Achilles and she dipped him in the river Styx. He was completely submerged except for his heel that she was holding him by. But it was that unsubmerged heel that was ultimately the place where Achilles was mortally wounded. You see, the only part of your life that is vulnerable to Satan is that part that has not been surrendered totally to King Jesus. And so when we're a part of the kingdom of God, we surrender to his rule. But there's a second truth about the kingdom of God you need to understand as you pray. And that is the kingdom of God is both a present reality and a future hope. When we surrender to to God's rule in our lives, we are experiencing the kingdom of God in part. But as we look around us, we realize that something is still wrong with the world. You see, the kingdom of God will not ultimately be established until Jesus returns and makes everything right. And so when we pray, your kingdom come, we are looking at this fallen world in which we live, realizing that there has to be something better, and we're praying that God's kingdom will come soon. We see killing the unborn. We see homosexuality celebrated. We see the ever-increasing divorce rate. We see single moms raising kids by themselves. We, we see rampant pornography, racial prejudice, greed, and political corruption. We see wars and more wars. And we long for Jesus to come back and set up his kingdom. The early church... Look forward to the return, the imminent return of Christ. They long for Christ to come back. But I'm afraid many of us today are too busy enjoying the fallen world. We want to enjoy this world a little longer, and then he can come back. And so we pray, your kingdom come. But there's a second part of this petition, and that's this. Your will be done. You see, God has a will for your life. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says that God's will is good and pleasing and perfect. The only problem is you have a will as well. And oftentimes our will is in conflict with God's will. And when that happens, we have to decide, am I going to pursue my will, which I think is best, or am I going to pursue God's will, which I know is best? You see, the purpose of prayer is not to get my will done in heaven. The purpose of prayer is to get God's will done on earth and in my life. One of the greatest prayer promises found in the Bible is, is 1 John 5, 14 and 15. It says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he 
hears us and we know that if he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. But that leads to a difficult truth because each and every one of us knows that God's will is not always done. And why? Well, I believe it's because as we read God's will, we discover that God's will falls into two categories. First of all, there is God's providential will, His sovereign will. God's providential will is that that he, He has a plan for human history. Jesus will return. Satan will be defeated. The saints will rule with God forever and ever. And nothing can stop that plan from happening. But God also has a permissive will. There are things that God wants to see happen. There are things that God longs to see happen. But because he has created us with a free will, they don't happen. For instance, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4 says, God wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. And yet we know that everyone isn't going to be saved. God has given us the freedom to reject him or refuse him if that's what we want. Or what about 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3? It says, God's will is for you to be holy. Stay away from all sexual sin. God's will for every man and woman is that they remain sexually pure until their wedding night. But not every person and not even every Christian has done that. It's God's will, but it's not done. Or what about this? 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18. Be thankful in all circumstances for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. And yet we know that everyone who belongs to Jesus doesn't have a thankful spirit. Some Christians are just plain out grumpy. You see, God has a will and our prayers should focus on seeking and then surrendering to that will. You see, prayer should only have one priority, and that's not to get God to do what I want, but to want what God wants and then ask Him to do it. One of the most misunderstood verses in the Bible is Psalm 37, verse 4. It says, delight yourself also in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Now, that doesn't mean that if we delight in the Lord, He will give us whatever we want. It's saying that if we delight in the Lord, we already have what we want. And that leads to why many of our prayers go unanswered. The reason they go unanswered is because they are selfish prayers. James said it this way. He said, when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. So are you praying my will be done or are you praying God's will be done? Now there are some people that say that we should never pray if it be your will. But I would tell you this morning that they are wrong. Jesus is the perfect example of one who surrendered to the will of God. No one was ever more committed to God's will than Jesus. But when he was in the garden... Before he was crucified on that cross, he said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Jesus knew what was about to happen. He knew the pain, the agony, the separation that was about to take place. And he prayed, Father, if there's any way, remove this from me. But in the end, I don't want my will. I want your will. He was perfectly surrendered, submitted to his Father's will. But Satan, on the other hand, is a perfect example of someone who wanted his own will. In Isaiah 14, it says this, How have you fallen from heaven, O morning star? You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you were brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. I will, I will, I will. So let me ask you a question. Are you going to seek your will? Or are you going to seek God's will? When you pray. Because if you're going to pray according to Jesus' pattern, it's not about getting God to do what you want. 
It's about bending your will to God so that you want what he wants. So would you bow your head and and close your eyes with me right now? Now let me remind you that it's God's will that you are saved and you come to a knowledge of the truth. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, God's will is that you're saved. God's will is that no one perish, but that everyone repent. God wants a relationship with you. And so will you humble yourself today? Will you choose His will and enter into a relationship with Him? I want you to pray this prayer with me if that's what you want. Dear God, I humbly come before you today acknowledging that I am a sinner I've lived life my way. I've chosen my will over your will. Please forgive me. I don't want to live this way anymore. Jesus, I believe you came to this earth. You died on a cross. You rose from the grave so that my sins could be forgiven and I could be made new. Jesus, I'm trusting you to save me. I'm giving my life to you. Come into my heart and make me brand new. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing my prayer and saving me. Amen.